into the future. Excellent. Thanks for that introduction. Uriel, do you want to jump in and introduce yourself? Yeah. Hi, Brian. Uh, this is, it's such a honor to be invited to this session and to, to remember Esquivel's genius legacy. Um, I am a music journalist. I've been on the record music industry since 1992. I used to work at a record store back in 1994. I received a uh, the Space Age Bachelor Pad Music CD uh, by Barnon. And that was like the moment when I received like the call or the summon to, <laughs> to share the, the gospel of Esquivel to everyone I met. I was very passionate. I was crazy about Esquivel for the first decade. I made a documentary as Arturo says, I used to be the musical contents manager at Ibero 90.9, a public radio station in the sort of KCRW or KEXPX, but in Mexico City, and we made a documentary around Esquivel. We used his music for bumpers on radio shows, and every student and volunteer that came into the radio station was exposed to the music of Esquivel. And uh, in a way, maybe sometimes in a low key, sometimes uh, up frontally, I've been pushing Esquivel's music and supporting him, and just trying to to make a space for him in official Mexican history, because I know there's a place for him in, in a way, in a niche international music history, not in Mexico, shamefully. Uh, so I'm part of that uh, informal, casual, uh, very small elite group of Esquivel uh, lovers or uh, uh, how I call it, no? like <laughs> adepts that uh, was touched by his music. I met him personally for a few minutes in 1996. So here I am still being summoned to speak about Esquivel and I'm happy to, to share that with you all and with like-minded uh, persons. So, so the message right now will resonate a lot more. So thank you, Brian, for inviting me. Yeah, no, I'm, it's, it's great to have you. And, and you know, part of the reason I wanted to do this too was the, and I think I, I wrote about this earlier, uh, it is, you know, when we go on tour and, and the tours with the, the mega band are, are, they're just insane. There's so many things going on because there's so many people involved. It's just nuts. I don't remember half the people. I don't remember half the things I said, who I met. Like people are like, oh, I met you at this show. It's like, I have no idea who you are. I feel terrible because your brain's like going a thousand miles an hour when, when you're there. And there's never time to do this kind of stuff. So like when I went there and we brought the band there, I never really had a chance to like, just slow things down and kind of understand the context of like, who is this guy Esquivel in the context of now, like in Mexico, how do people know his music? You know, I, I get a chance to ask a couple of people here and there, but I don't have that feel for it. So I kind of wanted to get that feel for like today, what it's like, like, is this like old people's music? Do young people know who he is? Like out of, you know, if I took 10 cab rides in Mexico city, how many of the cab drivers would know who Esquivel was out of 10? Like, that's a great question right there. How many would know? Zero? No. One? Oh, 10? X? Yeah, no. <laughs> no. Void. None. Void. No. Wow. Okay. So zero. So less than one would know. Okay. So he's still like pretty, pretty unknown, it sounds like uh, there. And that's been my experience too. When I meet, when I meet Mexicans in the United States, most of them have no idea. They might know Burbujas. The, 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 this is the... Uh, 1970s Sesame Street equivalent for the American audience here uh, that, that he did the soundtrack for. They might know that, but like a 20 year old won't know it because because Burbujas isn't on the air anymore, right? So they don't know that reference, but that's like, so so we're, we're gonna get to this. I don't wanna get off, uh, get off track here. I actually, before we get into that, I thought we'd kind of give an overview. There may be some people here who don't know uh, much about Esquivel. Uh, and so I thought a fun way to introduce people to his music um, would be to have a book reading here. Uh, this book is short. It's about nine minutes long. Uh, and we're going to be reading this book in Spanish, uh, partly for rights issues, but I think culturally it's kind of fun too. The book will be read in Spanish, but we'll be showing the, the book cover, the actual pages of the book, the pictures, and the words in English. So if you're not bilingual, you can still follow along here. Um, there's a little backstory in this book. Um, the book's called uh, Esquivel Space Age Sound Artist, and this book uh, was published right here in Boston where I'm based, and there's an inside hook here because the, uh, one of the w uh, women that uh, sings in the big band, Yolanda, who's 
uh, our soprano, um, she's the uh, head editor, the editor in chief at Charles Bridge. And she thought that Esquivel's music being so visual, you, you'll hear about this a lot, and maybe Arturo will talk about that with the film. There's a very kind of visual component to his sound would make a good picture storybook for children. Uh, so this book was written in both English and Spanish. Uh, it was uh, illustrated by a Mexican award-winning uh, illustrator as well. Uh, and it is available in both uh, Spanish and English. So we'll be dropping the, the links in uh, to the chat uh, later on if you guys are interested in purchasing the book. But uh, I think I'm going to go ahead and pass the ball to you, uh, Uriel. We'll, we'll kick that off with the book reading, if that sounds good. So if you can uh, share your screen and, and introduce us to the book. <clears throat> yeah. First of all, I have the, the physical copy here. I purchased it on Amazon. This is the English version. I actually didn't know there was a Spanish version, so I'll purchase it also. OK. Beautiful edition. Yeah, I have my copy yeah, right so over there. So <laughs> the time for screen sharing. Let's see. Mm -hmm. OK, so here I am. Uh, disclaimer, I will try to read all the onomatopoeias, all the sounds like in a mystical way. I'll try to enact them. So <laughs> bear with me. And uh, here we go. Excellent. Okay, so Esquivel, space age sound artist, Susan Wood, illustrated by Duncan Tonatius. So that's the book, uh, Esquivel, space age sound artist. And Uriel, thank you so much for your reading. I'm going to quickly uh, drop the link in for anyone that's, uh, we're, we're not getting any money or anything like that. It's not what this is about. We just want to share the book. Uh, I, I was very thankful that Charles Bridge allowed us to actually do this reading here. So the books, uh, I just dropped the link in the chat if you're interested in it. Um, so uh, ch check it out. It makes a good gift uh, for, for a little one that might be into your life. Um, but uh, yeah, I think, I think that, was, that was fun to hear you read it. And uh, I hope the book gets around Mexico a little bit. Do, do, you, do you know anyone that, uh, obviously you don't, because you said you hadn't heard it was even available in Mexico. Arturo, were you, were you aware of, uh, well, obviously, I totally forgot, you had consulted on the book, as did I. I, I actually, my involvement all, it was pretty small. Uh, Yolanda actually asked me to kind of review some of the, the, the words and sounds that he used in the music to compare it with what they wrote in there. Uh, oh, you have your notes. And, and, and I did a little bit of stuff with the illustrations to make sure like, oh, he's playing the gong, but like the mallet's upside down. <laughs> so some small things to make sure that the uh, instruments were positioned correctly and being played right in the illustrations and, and a couple other minor errors. But Arturo, maybe you can, uh, we can jump to you. You can tell us a little bit about what your involvement was with this uh, text. Um, yeah, so um, I was like so surprised when around 2014 uh, you mentioned that Yolanda was working on this book, which is one of the many, many reasons, right, that um, I think all of us are still interested in this figure and my film is still something that I work on constantly because there are these signs of people still out there interested in him and people still wanting to share his work and his life with with other uh, potential Esquivel fanatics. So in 2014, uh, you put us in contact and Yolanda and I started talking about the book. And besides, you know, like the basic things, uh, he was born in Tampico, you should change this, the state might be wrong. Um, I told Yolanda, one of the biggest things that I've encountered is that Esquivel and the myth is just that. You know, um, there's a lot of information out there that contradicts itself. And I think that's also kind of a playful way that Esquivel would sometimes talk to the press or other people about his life and his work. You know, there, there wasn't like um, um, an anecdote that everybody knew the same way. Everybody had a different version of it. And I think um, I told Yolanda that outside of like hard facts, like places and dates, like they should feel free to, to create this mythology. To, to allow themselves to have Esquivel become bigger than he was and this icon that most of us see him as. So that was really cool to see and now to listen to Uriel's reading and, and see this whole life uh, take shape in, in this really interesting and original form. Awesome. <clears throat> um, are there any questions uh, so far for Arturo or for any, uh, any of the guests? about the text or anything else? Let's see. Oh my God, I love your place. I love your place too, Arturo. <laughs> yeah, I, 
it's uh it might look like a virtual background but it's 100 percent real <laughs> my hand usually disappears like this normally <laughs> cool um so uh we have a question uh from howard um howard i'd like to invite you up do you want to come and uh, ask ask your question uh let's see Am I there? Can you hear me? You are. I'm going to unpin my, I think, uh, is anyone canceled the spotlight? There we go. So now when you talk, you should appear for everybody. Okay. You can hear me now? Everyone I can. can. I'm, just, I'm just curious uh, whether it seemed from the book that he was self-taught, but it doesn't go into detail. Did he never get any training in, in, in reading and writing music or, or, you know, theory, harmony, anything? Do you guys know? I, I actually don't know if he was formally taught or not. My understanding was that he was not. Yeah, me neither. The, I mean, it's amazing to have been able to, I assume he wrote down parts for the musicians. He didn't just tell, talk to them and tell them what to do. So. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah and where he learned that, I, I, I actually don't, I, I don't know. Um, but he, absolutely, okay. he scored. Uh, otherwise, these recordings would not have happened, and they happened rather quickly as well. So... Um, all the music was scored for sure. Uh, there's no way that there's no way that stuff was communicated orally in the studio. Right. You know, the I mean, parts are way too intricate. The book, it makes it look, he pointed to people and said, "You do this." You know. Um. <laughs> well, the reason it said that the, well, the way I the, the 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 reason it says that is because the way I understand it, um, he was very particular, as a lot of conductors are. But he was very particular in the studio about what he wanted, and I, I, as I understand it, he was you know, telling people to move six feet over here, a lot of it for audio reasons, because Esquivel was an engineer uh, prior to, to his, his kind of music career. There's a funny video you can see on YouTube where he's being interviewed in the 70s. And it's like, so why did you get into music? It's like, well, frankly, I couldn't make any money as an engineer. So I decided to go into music, <laughs> which I think is like the best quote ever. But uh, so he, he was very meticulous about these kind of decisions and 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 telling people where he wanted them and and i kind of imagine him as a little bit of a madman in the studio i'm not sure what his demeanor was but um you know i, I can imagine he was probably a little bit of a hard ass maybe i don't know like <laughs> going back to this idea that his myth is even bigger you know that what because of what he was creating like he has that quote, right, Brian? But he starts working at XEW, the radio station, the biggest radio station in Mexico City, when he was only 14. <clears throat> but I don't think he even had uh, an idea that, you know, he would potentially work as an engineer. I think his, his involvement in the radio station at such an early age really gave him the opportunity to just be around musicians. You know, this was the time when, like, big, big groups of musicians would come into the studios and play live for, you know, the, the storytelling hour or even the, the Colgate commercials or the cereal brand commercial. Everyone was playing live. So just to be surrounded by that, I think that uh, might be a, a good way to understand how he started to, you know, understand in his meticulous way how things worked and how he would take it apart as a good engineer would, right? Like take every element apart and maybe reverse engineer it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's that's <clears throat> very enlightening. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks for the question. Like the, the usual story talks about like the first memory of Esquivel is working, yeah, at the XEW, La XEW, the first radio station in Mexico, La Voz de la America Latina, the voice of Latin America. And he playing the piano and improvising on this uh, comic shows, stand up. There were like live shows, you know, like radio back then was more of a theater, like a late night show with an orchestra with advert live advertising. Uh, but I'm, I, I have a book in hand right now. I don't know if you see my screen. Yes. Screen. Yeah. Well, this is a book that came in the centenary. It's like a more like an artistic impression made by La Duplicadora. And it's got many prints uh, and, uh, you know, like, it's like interpretations, <laughs> some ugly, some don't, some very avant-garde. You see, this is the cover, mm -hmm. La Duplicadora. And uh, there's a timeline at the end, a very essential timeline for Esquivel. And there's a fact I didn't know just quickly. Um, it says in 19... 28, he comes to Mexico City. By 1931, he plays the piano in Luis Arcaraz's orchestra. 
And in 1932, he works at the radio station XCW. But this is interesting. Luis Arcaraz is a master of, of Mexican music. He, he had this orchestra. They played danzón. They played romantic music, classical music, waltzes, uh, valses, sorry. And maybe I'm just making this hypothesis uh, that Luis Arcaraz was a mentor for Esquivel in, in this formal way, taking him from empirical to more formal, just a hypo. Cool. Thank you for that the information. Um, uh, Cody, I don't know if you're on there. It looks like you were next up if you want to ask your question or I can just refer it if you want. Just hit in the chat if you'd like me to send it, uh, if you'd like me to announce your question. Let's see if Co Cody, Cody shows up. He's unmuted. Nope, he's muted. I guess he's uh, still muted. I'll, I'll just go ahead and say, uh, oh, he doesn't have a mic. That's okay. Um, you asked a um, question about his arrangements. Nobody has any of them. <laughs> uh, that's, cor um, that's almost correct. There, there was one arrangement that looked more like a transcription to me from some publisher, I believe of all places in Sedona, Arizona. I'm actually from Arizona. We tracked one down when I was in the process of trying to find the scores uh, to, this, to his big band work so we could go play it. Um, mini skirt i think it was mini skirt or yayo one of those two kind of the more the lounge kind of stuff that we don't do as much of that repertoire that he wrote uh that's the only written uh stuff that was left over all the rest of the manuscripts were lost um we actually covered all this in in the remotely music series uh the set, uh, number two uh which was two months ago so that's up on facebook and youtube if you guys want to check it out but we go really i went really into detail on the transcription process of reviving this music so it could be heard again. So uh, so we covered that al already on the previous one. Um, um, yes, you did, but I was hoping other folks in this chat might know. Yeah, I, Cody, as far as I know, th this question's been asked many times over the last 15 years, so I'm pretty sure at this point nobody has these scores. Uh, if they did, they probably would have surfaced at this point. So as far as we know, they've been lost in the desert, and that's, that's the end of it. So um yeah that's uh that's one of the legends right that um once he was he was in in vegas in nevada and they had to take everything because he owed money so all his gold records everything that he was uh, basically storing surrounding his his work um got dumped somewhere some people even say that you know that if you dig somewhere in the nevada desert <laughs> you'll find a crate full of esquivel stuff which is a dream and something that actually happened. I don't know. There's a uh, there was a documentary a few years back where uh, there was a rumor that they dumped a uh, a video game, an Atari video game, because of X, Y, and Z reason. And the filmmakers went out and they actually found it, and it was buried like in the middle of the desert. So it, it's still a possibility. So maybe if we can get together a bunch of people, maybe we can go out in the desert and find something. <laughs> We let's got 50 shovels. <laughs> All right, let's crash Area 51. Yeah. <laughs> they already did that like two months ago. Did, did anyone in the chat go on that, the, the rush of, of Area 51? What was that about? There was something in the news where some guy as a joke said they were going to go to rush the, the Area 51 and then like a million people RSVP'd on Facebook for this thing. I don't know. So, oh, Mike has drones, so that, that will help us out. <laughs> Excellent. Um, I actually, uh, I'm going to interrupt this real quick and see if I can put somebody on the spot here. Uh, this is a surprise that, that Uriel doesn't know about and Arturo doesn't know about either. I don't know if he's going to be willing to do it, but Javier uh, Garcia is here. Um, I want to bring you up on the screen and introduce you if you're willing to come on. He doesn't know that I was going to ask him to do this. Uh, Javier, are you, are you willing to, to show yourself? I, I'm going to unmute him, see if he'll... He'll chime in and maybe turn his video on. I'll tell you who he is in just a second. Can you guys hear me? There. Oh, shit. <laughs> What's up, man? How are you? This How's is Javier going? Garcia, and he's at his home bar. Is that your bar? Is that your grunge bar? Yeah, I think it's my <laughs> screen from my last meeting. It's a, it's a bar. <laughs> Well, everybody, this is Javier Garcia. He's uh, in, in uh, Redwood City, California, in the Bay Area, last time I checked. And Javier is the artist that did all of the Exotica for Modern Living artwork uh, on our records. So if you like the mid-century vibe, 
Uh, this is the, the gentleman who's done all that work and, and I will come break his arm if he refuses to do the future <laughs> records that we, <laughs> that we make. But he's a, a wonderful illustrator and, and uh, it's great that you're here and uh, you're also from Mexico originally. And, and uh, I just wonder if you, if you wanted to share any, anything about your experience with Esquivel or just, just any thoughts on whether the artwork or just knowing him or, you know, your kind of Impressions. Yeah, thanks for the introduction. Unfortunately, I, I didn't have the pr the pleasure of uh, knowing him, but <laughs> um, I did have the pleasure of designing this covers for Brian and uh, and researching a little bit more about him. And um, yeah, it's really interesting to see how all this came together uh, as far as um, Brian's recordings and all that. Um, I don't know if I have a lot to add. I think a lot of a lot of it has been said here, but um, yeah, it's definitely, I grew up with this stuff, um, with the show Burbujas and all this stuff. And, uh, uh, I didn't actually didn't know much about it at the time. I don't know that he created those songs until later, much later. Uh, but yeah. Cool. Well, it's, it's great to see you and, and, uh, it's been a long time. Your hair has changed. It looks like it's blonde now. Is that right? <laughs> yeah. I got a little bit of a, a look changed here. Uh, got a little bored and mess with my hair a little bit. <laughs> COVID cut. All right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, it's great. Great to see you. And, and thanks for your great work on, on, on the records. And, and, uh, it's, it's just fun to pull you up here. So cool. Thank you guys, yeah, we yeah. should, let's, let's, let's do a hang at some point and catch up. Yep. Cool, man. <clears throat> Um, I, so the, this kind of next, uh, I think we had a couple, sorry, we had a couple other, uh, questions here. Anyone know what songs Esquivel recorded with a theremin? I don't know, Rodrigo, uh, Arturo, do you know? Um, I, I'm pretty sure that Spellbound is one of them. I, I would have to go back, but I'm like a hundred percent sure at least that one, um, that one did... Arturo is kind of the Wikipedia, in, in my, <laughs> in my no, opinion, he's the Wikipedia because you talk to every living soul that <laughs> that knew this guy. And I feel I'm like I'm one of the librarian, just getting <laughs> the book together. Um, could you tell, uh, what, tell me a little bit about, like, the Mexican? We I kind of asked this before, but I you, you said like no one really knows uh, uh, about him. So if you were going to try to find someone in Mexico that actually knew about him, would you go to the older generation? Would you go to the city? Would you go to his hometown? Like, or, and feel free both you guys to, to jump in here, but like, is there any place where he's kind of known in, in Mexico or the hipster record collectors, you know, like? <laughs> so, so that has been like kind of one of the most fun parts of making the film, you know, finding out who knows because one person is going to lead you to the next. You know, like Brian knows Irwin and Irwin knows, knows Byron and Camilo knows this person. Um, the fun, like one of, well, at least one of the like most surprising things is that when you stumble upon people, I, I met a, an older lady in Mexico City who was, who said, oh yeah, in high school, Esquivel used to play in our dances. And she had a bunch of anecdotes about him being already this like big figure and very imposing and cool uh, person always leading a band. Um, but, but I think for me at least, uh, I don't know about you Uriel, but I think it does take a special kind of music nerd to know about Esquivel, especially mm -hmm. in Mexico. I think collectors, obsessive people into music, into finding out new stuff, into digging deep into culture, pop culture, weird sounds. Uh, those are the people that I found uh, a common thread throughout the, the Esquivel uh, right. fan base. Right, yeah, right. So same, same opinion here. Like if you ask someone born before 1950, they may tell you that they, they saw Esquivel on a college ballroom dance, uh, seldomly. It's a name that sounds, resounds uh, very far. Uh, there's a movie from 1957 where Esquivel is on screen. The, 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 the film is called La Locura del Rock and Roll, and it's on YouTube. We may, yes. we may paste the link because it's available completely on YouTube. And some people have watched that film. Apart from that, it's like Esquivel was abducted by aliens from Mexican pop culture <laughs> and Mexican official history. 
And that's my whole point and my whole crusade around Esquivel is that Mexican entertainment from the 20th century has icons, very clear icons, uh, like Cantinflas or Tintan or Chespirito, El Chavo del Ocho. Uh, like most of them were on TV or, or you can also speak about Pedro Infante, you know, pop icons that were on film, but Esquivel was just on one film or they were on the boom of, of Mexican television, Televisa company, Televisa broadcasting networks from the 60s, 70s and on. But Esquivel was not here when the picture of Mexican pop culture was taken. Just like imagine like a Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band picture of Mexican icons from the 20th century. Esquivel was not here. He was in New York, he was in Las Vegas being famous and being bigger, larger than life than he would have been in Mexico. So he is known elsewhere but in Mexico and uh, the only clue other people may have the, the entry point for someone to talk about Esquivel is he made the music for Odisea Burbujas and then they would go like okay I know Odisea Burbujas but haven't paid attention to the music I may remember the theme song and I, I own this the, the vinyl because the vinyl was on every Mexican household in the 80s and we all generation Xers we all saw Odisea Burbujas and it was amazing to understand in the 90s when Esquivel was reissued and there was this lounge revival that Esquivel was there on our childhoods. So it was about recovering our own childhoods and, and seeing that Esquivel was there. And then listening again to the record and finding amazing tunes. I personally love Popotitos 22, the, the song dedicated to the UFO where this gang travels. I have two, two Odisea Burbujas records here. If you, if you don't know, if you haven't ever heard or don't know what Odisea Burbujas is, as Brian said, is this um, Sesame Street, but not. It's one more like the Teletubbies adventures in time. And <laughs> they met Napoleon, they met Albert Einstein, and they traveled through time and space with this math professor. There was this math professor, Professor Memelovsky, who enlarged these creatures. So it was a giant toad, a giant lizard, a giant bumblebee, and a giant mouse, baby mouse. And those, these were heroes in Mexican morning, Sunday morning television. So here are the songs. And yeah, Popotitos 22, they traveled on a UFO. And the, the song, if you actually listen to it, is crowd rock. This, this album was recorded, I guess, in 1979 or 81. Yeah, 1979. And I wonder what SQL was listening to in those years, because of course he made swing, big band, lounge. We all know that music. But what was he listening in the 70s? And perhaps he was listening to, I don't know, Tangerine Dream, Klaus Schulz, Can, Noi. Because if you listen to that track, Stereo Lab might have played it. It's actually crowd rock. <laughs> Age rock slash crowd rock. So yeah, I, I want, I'm, I'm going through a rabbit hole, I know. But all I want to, to, to just come around into the idea is that no one knows about Esquivel, only Odisea Burbujas. He was, of course, he was in this a ceremony at the well miniskirt was played on the on 2010 uh, centenary of the mexican revolution but you see miniskirt was only a three minutes hit on this right. extravaganza so it, it was unadverted and my crazy dream about esquivel is that he should have a statue he should be on a pesos bill he should be on a postal stamp somewhere but there's no official recognition for him and seldomly, there's a person like Arturo, like me, like Camilo, like Carlos Icaza, like someone that on their trip of music discovery, they stumble upon jazz, they stumble upon lounge, swing, the, the, the revival from the 90s, Les Baxter, Martin Denny, Henry Mancini, perhaps, Javier Cugat. And then they stumble upon Esquivel and they found, find out that he was Mexican. But then again, it's just like a banished person in this Mexican family. And that's like a, I feel this is like a crime because he's a true genius that should be acknowledged in a very high level. That's yeah. my <laughs> Yeah. I, I also heard, um, and Julian, we'll, we'll bring you up in just a second. One of, one of our audience members has a comment about Burbujas and Esquivel. Um, I don't know, if maybe you guys can react to this, but I, I as I recall, and again, this is foggy, the, the tours and just how much stuff's going on on the tours, but I feel like I remember the older generation there, uh, you know, I'm going to say, you know, if this was 2013 was the last time I was there, people probably in their 60s, 70s at the time or older absolutely did know him or 
selection bias, right? They're at the Esquivel concert, so of course they probably know who he is, but they remembered him from the 40s and radio as a radio big band person, not as an RCA Living Stereo recording artist, but very much a radio big band uh, arranger, you know, something along those lines. So I don't know if that generation is just kind of passing along at this point and, and maybe not passing it down, <laughs> uh, you know, passing down the, 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 the sound. And, and I don't know, that, that's, that's just a memory I have that I thought I'd share. But uh, Julian, did you want to come on and, and, and say something? I'm going to unmute you if you'd like to, to, to come on. Let me see if I can spotlight you. Yeah, sure. Can you hear me, guys? I can, man. How are you? Fine, fine. Thank you. Nice to, to see you, all of you, Uriel, Arturo, Brian. Thank you, guys. About the Burukas, I'm, I, I am working about in a big investigation about Esquivel. This is for my university, but maybe I'm working in a, in a, in a bigger thing that it's a book about Esquivel. And two weeks or maybe three weeks ago, I was talking with Luis Roche. Luis Roche is the son of um, Silvia Roche. She was the producer of Burbujas. Uh -huh. and, 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 and he told me a lot of things about uh, her, his mother, an Esquivel, and he shared me a link uh, with a great video when she appears talking about the history when she met Esquivel. I'm gonna share this link in the chat right now. Oh, okay, great. Awesome. Thank you Thank for you. for doing that. Yeah, the uh, Thank you, I actually met her uh, and maybe I'll dig out a photo here if I can do it and, and host everything. But I have a photo of, of her with Steve Reed, uh, who is a friend of Esquivel's, who, whose dad did the voice of Fred Flintstone. Um, he, he, he was actually in Mexico this first year when we went down there. Uh, Erwin Chusid's there. So we have this nice photo right around a poster of when Esquivel's uh, remix album came out. Um, so there's a bunch of the, bunch of these people were there, but I, I do remember meeting her there. Um, so, so yeah. And Mike, uh, yes, there is uh, footage. Uh, let's see, uh, live footage. Arturo, I'll probably let you answer that. There, there is that Lake Tahoe thing that I think is, uh, it's like not, <laughs> it's not my favorite video. Um, I'm trying to think besides La Locura de Rock and Roll, whether or not there's any other footage of him playing. I think there is, right? You have some. Uh, this is totally your area. I'm just going to let you talk and shut up. Tell us about uh, that. Yeah, that's one of the most difficult things about making this, um, this film. And I've talked to Julian about this, and I talked to you, Brian, and Uriel is about how um, and you'll see in the teaser, like Esquivel's music is very visual. You know, it creates an, an image in your head immediately. So the, one of the saddest parts is that like, a lot of Esquivel's uh, footage of him playing, of him being interviewed, is has been lost. Uh, we have a couple of interviews, the Bob Wilkins one, which is uh, the most popular one, and uh, that Locura del Rock and Roll, which is a hilarious, super fun film that um, yeah, we'll, we'll link. Um, but other than that, we don't have like a complete song. We don't have a complete concert of him. Uh, we don't have him working behind the scenes. You know, we don't see that meticulous nature of him. Not like you said, not only arranging um, the instruments, but the people and asking uh, the vocalist to, you know, move around so visually to him, it looks better to have the blonde singer next to the redhead, next <laughs> to the brunette. Um, so we have to, he left us with all of this music and, and now it's up to us kind of to, to imagine, you know, to create this visual landscape based on, on his creativity and, and the work that, that he left. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> uh, any other questions here? Or, or I'm thinking maybe we should uh, introduce the, Film preview. Uh, do you, does anyone have any, have any other questions before we, we kind of transition to Arturo to talk a little bit more about this this film project? Looks like uh, I'm just reading the chat. Can episodes of the children's show be seen? So this is Borbujas. Is that still on streaming or something like that in Mexico? I don't think so. No. But, well, Televisa has a service like a Netflix called Blim, but I'm not sure if Blim offers uh, Borbujas reruns. I'm looking right now on you, at YouTube, see if I can I can find something. <laughs> cool. I will post the, the intro where, where there's a theme song by Esquivel, so you can watch. Got it, got it. 
Uh, Arturo, why don't we? Uh, 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 why don't you talk a little bit about uh, the film? You've, you've dabbled in it a little bit here, but I kind of want to just let you uh, in- introduce your, your project. How long you've been working on it? Tell us about who who you've spoken to. What's the status of the film? Um, and, and then, of course, when you're ready, we're, we're going to take a look at the preview. Yeah. Um, thanks, Brian. So yeah, it's been a project that we've been working on for almost ten years now, starting from the time that I was working. Um, with Uriel at 90.9, the the FM radio station in Mexico City, and how he literally introduced me to his music. Like he said, you know, you in in Mexico, you start listening to uh, Sergio Mendes and, you know, like everything, Mancini, and then you stumble upon Esquivel. And I think Uriel's passion for him really um, stuck with me. And (laughs) when I... um, when I heard about you, Brian, and other people basically still keeping his legacy alive, I thought that that was a really good way to approach this project. You know, I, I think for me personally, these films, documentaries that are about an artist, and they're only a series of talking heads saying, you know, how wonderful the artist was and how perfect everything they did is, uh, doesn't leave you with much beyond that. You feel like you leave the movie theater two hours later with knowing everything and not with the curiosity of of somebody uh, that wants to explore more. So I really, my intention ultimately for this would be to show not only Esquivel's work, but how his legacy has expanded in many ways. Like I mentioned, it's with writers and illustrators, designers, cartoonists, Uh, musicians of different kinds of famous people and people that are just starting uh, in the States and in different parts of of the world. And and you start to discover like really, really small segments of of really furiously, you know, like dedicated Esquivel fans. Um, They do festivals around Esquivel in places like Utah in a place where 30,000 people live, you know, small towns, and they still are playing Esquivel's music. And you have Brian traveling all over um, and organizing these concerts because of his passion. So so that is what the film is about. You know, it's it's about him, but it's also about the people that have a connection to him, people that got to meet him, but also met him only through his music, people that like his aesthetic and people that find his music intricate or funny or original or everything, a combination of everything. Um, This is a little teaser. It's about four minutes long and it's kind of an introduction to the kind of people and faces and spaces that you'll see. Um, Obviously, this is a big documentary in that it would need a lot of music. You know, I don't think it would be fair to have a feature length Esquivel um, movie without having dozens of songs and having footage and having access to it. So it's still in development, let's call it. But um, I think slowly we're, we're getting to a point where more people are interested, where more spaces like this one that you created, Brian, have allowed us to highlight Esquivel's work and people like Julian and myself doing work about Esquivel and around him. So if that's okay with you, Brian, I would like to share my screen. And yeah, actually, you. I want to ask you a couple of questions yeah. that I want to know. Like, yeah, yeah, for sure. Let's get, some, let's get some data. How many countries, how many people, how much footage? Like, give people the scope of the coverage that you have. Um, so... I, this is kind of like, it's, it's been a really fun, it's kind of a, a journey in itself, which I also want to reflect in the film. Like I said, I travel, for example, from Mexico City to um, New York to interview someone. Somebody in New York tells me that there's somebody in Massachusetts and I travel there. Somebody in Massachusetts tell me that they know somebody in California, I travel there. And I end up in places like uh, Little Rock, Arkansas, Utah, Mexico City, Cuernavaca, people in Europe, especially in Germany, there's a big following there. Um, in Europe, it's, it's, it's pretty, pretty large. Um, some people in Chile. So it's, it's kind of like a connect the dots 
kind of one of those like FBI, you know, yeah. things where they have to like put the map and then there's a, a graph network. Map. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That starts connecting everything. And it's really nice because you ultimately like I, I discovered, and this is going to be in the film, how some people are immediately connected through that. There's some anecdotes that a person starts and another finishes uh, hundreds of miles away. You know, it's Brother Cleve saying, I was having a tequila at this bar in Coyoacan and I heard Esquivel and I turned around and there was this guy who I think was Camilo Lara. And yes. then Camilo continues the story. He's like, I heard this guy speaking in English and he approached me and said, did you just say Esquivel? Esquivel the musician. So, so it's really, like I said, it's kind of a family. It's a group of, of geeks, of passionate people about music, about original ideas, about creativity um, that has slowly expanded. And I think, obviously, we need to finish this project um, at, a, at a certain time, but we can keep going because more things pop up. You know, La Duplicadora did that book. And this children's book that came out is something that wasn't happening when we started making the film. Yeah. So, so it's been like a, a really interesting project that keeps evolving and keeps introducing more, more members to the family. Cool. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, I think, I think we should jump in and, and let people see this, uh, see this preview, see what's coming. So feel free to share your screen and, and, and take it away. Just make sure you share that sound with us too. Yep. Um, so obviously Zoom is what it is. So if it starts like jumping around, that's, uh, that's how it plays. But rest assured, it, uh, everything is okay. <laughs> okay, here we go. Oh, um, one second, sorry. Putting this password here. Um, uh, I think this is your your cue to do some music. Ah, actually, I'm going to bring up Vern. Vern, this is your moment because Vern wanted to share something. So I'm going to unmute you, and I will try to find you let's spotlight you so we can see you okay. yes okay yeah yeah hey how are you yeah doing good um i wanted to comment that um not only do i have lots of records and uh, you know the lounge music um easy listening of the 50s all that i also have a hobby of collecting children's books even though i have no children but i like them for the illustrations uh -huh. And so I was excited with this topic here, and I noticed the illustration of this book were by uh, Duncan Conatia. Uh -huh. And I just went to my bookshelf, and I realized I had two other books. I don't know if you can see. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Uh, and, and you had one on Diego Rivera. Yep. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting. Uh, what I looked up his short biography and his artwork is inspired by the mixed tech indeed people of mexico that's correct and so that's why i see the profiles and the, the styles and all that and i just find that uh, the illustrations of this book to be quite exciting to see so i was especially pleased to see him chosen as the illustrator for the Evel book yeah um, yeah they just, i I know that they really wanted to have a Mexican artist do the, this work and, and that his style was very distinct. And, and so I, I remember they, they did spend a lot of time in choosing him uh, when, when I was talking to Yolanda about this. So yeah, his, his okay. artwork is great. So thanks, yeah. thanks for sharing that thought. Yeah. yeah, I don't get to talk about my children's book collection with many people, so. <laughs> yeah, I know this is a random <laughs> random time to, to, yes. to do that, but, okay. but uh, okay. yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah thank you. <clears throat> All right, Arturo, I'm gonna kick it back to you. Ready to go. Okay. There you go. <laughs> Crowd is going wild. You can't hear anything because it's freaking Zoom, but like, <laughs> exactly. Golf clap. Applausos. That's right. That's right. <laughs> that's so, so good. So, how do we get to see this film? Well, um, there's 
two things I want to say here on, on behalf of Arturo. First of all, um, anytime you do stuff, a lot of people don't know this. There's a reason you don't see like Beatles music, for example, in lots of films. Why? Because it's really expensive to license music and film, especially uh, very popular songs, etc. cetera. Uh, and so Arturo needs support to make this film come alive. So um, he's not, uh, today we're not, we're not like collecting donations for the film directly online. Um, Arturo will, will share his contact information if you'd like to help support this film. There's a lot of editing that needs to be done, the rights issues, all this kind of stuff. It is a huge undertaking to do a work like this. Um, all these famous songs that we know, Night and Day, Take the A Train, all this, it's, it's, it's crazy to get clearances for that. So, um, but you have a project that people can support today. And he kind of, Arturo like didn't want to like talk about this because he thought like, oh, it's not really about Esquivel, but it's Mexico, it's vintage. I know that Orchestratica fans will be into this. And so you're working on your master's thesis project, right? It's called uh, El Fantasma. And this is a film, I'm just going to let you take it away, but I want, I, I, I really want you to show this film. I hope you'll say yes, that you'll show us this little preview. Uh, we have another preview for the guests here. And if you'd like to support, Arturo has an Indiegogo. I'm going to put the link in there, and I hope you guys will, will go and support his campaign on there to make this film. Because if you support this one, then he can put energy into the next one and, and get to this Esquivel thing at some point while we're all still alive. So <laughs> tell us about your current, your current uh, film. Um, so yeah, so what, so what's happening? I think I, um, I jumped the gun. My first feature was the Esquivel film without people knowing that I was actually a filmmaker, without um, me having the experience. And it's like you said, it's like a big undertaking. You know, most of Esquivel's music is not, um, it's licensed in different places. It's uh, written by different composers. So it's a lot of rights issues. The other thing is that since there's a, not a lot of uh, footage of him playing, we would also like to include uh, animated segments to um, illustrate some of the things. Like I think Uriel puts it beautifully, you know, like this piñata that explodes and the ceilings. I think that's such a, a great way to, to, see, to see on screen his work. So, so that has been like a, a pretty costly project to to actually do so what i what i'm doing right now is just finishing my master's degree in film here at uh in austin and this is also a film that maybe hopefully some people would be interested in even though it's um it's a narrative it's a fiction film a short film it's based on true events and real people it's based on Lee Harvey Oswald's visit to Mexico City in the fall of 1963, uh, two months before he was arrested for the assassination of President Kennedy. So um, it's a period piece. It's a moment in Mexico that a lot of people don't know, uh, a moment in time that historians, um, I think, um, don't give the weight that it deserves. So. Uh, I'm going to show you a little clip of, of the film. We're almost about to finish it, but we're still trying to find some, some support in, in different areas and funding in other areas. But this little clip is of him, of Lee, Lee Harvey Oswald, played by Eller Coltrane, who was the, the lead actor in the film Boyhood. Um, he plays Lee Harvey Oswald, and this is him attending a party thrown by the Cuban embassy in Mexico City, something that uh, happened in real life and something that hasn't been documented enough. So we kind of like took it as an artistic, you know, interpretation of, of what could have happened. So it's like a, a two minute, minute and a half clip that, that I'm gonna share with you guys right now. Okay, um, so yeah, this is obviously, this is not a, it's not about Esquivel or anything, but it's something that uh, Brian and I were talking about and I just wanted to share because maybe some people would be interested in the era and, and if somebody wants to, you know, watch the finished film once we, uh, we finish editing and doing the sound mix and the color correction and everything, uh, we'll post a link where you can be a part of the film, literally, you know, like if you want to have the link, if you have the, the download link, if you want to have a piece of the film as a prop, as wardrobe or anything. Um, we, we want you to be involved and, and for you to feel like you're a part of, 
of what I'm doing and then consequently on SQL's uh, documentary. Excellent. Thank, thank you for sharing that. Uh, I popped the link in the in the chat and I'll definitely be sending that out uh, to everyone I think here is, is, is on the mailing list. So I will definitely send that out if you'd like to do to do that later. But I hope you guys will consider uh, supporting our, Arturo's work here. Um, so thanks for sharing that. Did, did anyone have any questions about uh, any of these film projects or, or, or anything else that we've talked about uh, tonight? Oh, Howard had one above. Howard, I'm just going to pop you, uh, pop you back on and let you ask in, in person. Where okay. are you? Spotlight, you bang. Go ahead. Got it. Um, I'm just wondering if uh, anybody asked <clears throat> or went through uh, the Vegas local of the AFM to see if they could find any of the musicians that had played with them to interview. I, yeah, Arturo? yeah, we have a, a few um, people in our film right now that have work with him in Mexico, in Lake Tahoe, and in Vegas. Um, I think the it's, it's really interesting to hear their experience with him because I think across the board, everybody has said that he was extremely strict, you know, that he knew exactly what he wanted, that he uh, was very hard on the musicians and the singers, and that people were like afraid of him because <laughs> He had a very clear vision of what he wanted, but none of the people that we talked to have spoken about, you know, like being uh, mad or being frustrated at the, his work ethic. They were mostly impressed and, and very much, um, I feel like, scared of him in the best way possible, as, as, as scared as you can be. Uh, to your own boss and, and a person that's making something that might go over the head of, of many people. So, but yeah, that's a great question and, and we have, and it's, and it's really, really cool to, to talk to them like, like firsthand. That's, I think for me, that's the closest I've gotten to really experiencing how he works behind the scenes. Yeah. The, you know, there's, when you play with orchestras, you know, I freelance as an orchestral player, there's always conduct, you always come across conductors. I think it's less so these days. I feel like most conductors have kind of chilled out and gotten rid of some of the ego. Um, but you always have these. And, and I think most of it's like, you can put up with a character if you can see the mission and what they're trying to do. It's, it's, you get a lot of leeway from the artist if they believe in what you're trying to, to, to do with the music. And, and so I think we, we tolerate that because musicians are colorful colorful people and personalities. And so my, I imagine he was probably a lot of fun to, to, to work under. I would have loved to just hang out in the percussion section and just play, <laughs> not, con, not try to conduct, but I, it would have been a lot of fun to just do that. So um, Jill, do you, do you want to ask your question? Uh, I'm going to, I know Jill, I'm going to pop her up here, let her see if she wants to come on the screen and ask. I'll give her a few seconds here. Maybe she doesn't, I don't know if she has a. Um, yeah, yeah, I just, I'm just, you know, interested. He was such a character. And I'm just wondering if, you know, if there are any other things that you, you know, have learned about him. I just remember when I had, I mean, I had interviewed him back in the nineties, you know, for some, some zine. And, and when I was doing the research, you know, he gave me a different number of wives than somebody else. And I don't know. He, <laughs> such a character i just yeah. oh, that's what i'm i'm fascinated about and want to hear more about <laughs> do we have an official wife count or Turo or <laughs> i mean i don't want to get into personal stuff but yeah that's part of the, the myth right like i think people were still like wait did the last one count or uh but yeah that's a great question jill i think uh especially because so many people so many fans like and, I, and I'm going to leave it to him to talk a little bit about him. Um, got to meet him firsthand when he was in uh, Jutepec, a, a small town outside of Mexico City. Uh, he was bedridden, but he still had energy. You know, he still wanted to talk to people and have guests over and talk about his music and compose. He, he actually was working on, on new material while, while he was there. Um, so I think there's something very lively about him that was very infectious. I think his music did reflect his personality. He lived large. Obviously, he, um, he enjoyed this Vegas lifestyle, you know, maybe to his detriment. But he, um, he, he liked the, the nightlife and the lights and, 
and big things and to create these sounds that would, you know, like jump out of the speakers. Um, and I think his personality was like that, you know, that, that famous quote of like, I like fast cars and women and music, maybe not in that order. Um, <laughs> but, but I think he, he had this energy that was very infectious and extremely charismatic. Uh, I don't know, Uriel, what was your experience with him when, when you went to visit him? Well, uh, hold on. no, you're good. Well, it was it was difficult. Uh, it was hard for me because, uh, well, I used to work at a record store, mix up as a cleric in the '90s, early '90s. That's where I received the copy from Barnon Records, and I had the same experience as the guy you interviewed and showed on this trailer. Like uh, back then, there were ironic bands, uh, ironic grunge bands with the uh, names uh, as titles, say Chavez or Gomez. So when I got this record by Esquivel, I thought, well, this is a new grunge band from soft pop records or something. And the uh, lounge artwork was very in fashion in those days. The lounge revival maybe happened first graphically, I guess like uh, Matt Groening or uh, John Crefalcusi, the, author, the, the, invent, the, the one that created Renan Stimpy. So lounge was, was before Esquivel was, was there. So I received that, this record and uh, just played as a, as a sample, uh, just to, to have a, uh, to, to listen to it before selling it. And yeah, I was amazed because I was already on a quest to listen to my parents' vinyls and they, they owned like uh, these Exotica records and Ray Conniff records and that. So I fell in love automatically with this, uh, with this sound. Uh, I was also a lot into Kitsch music and kitsch aesthetic and watching B movies from Mexico from the 60s and 50s. So this went up my alley. And uh, I started selling this record like uh, like <laughs> a stupid, like I was offering it to everyone so much. I was so tired of this mantra of explaining what was behind this record that I wrote a note and then I took it to my, my university journal, the, the campus journal. And that was my first note written as a journalist in my whole career. The first note I wrote and my name was in it was about Esquivel. And then, uh, if you have seen the Brothers Cohen uh, Hot Soccer's Proxy, maybe you remember that film where this guy kept uh, a paper on the back of his trousers and showed it to everyone, and it was just a circle. And this circle was the hula hula and the straw and the frisbee and the whole the great inventions from the 20th century. Well, once uh, Camilo Lara came to the record store to buy the record, I showed him the note. I also showed the, showed the note to, to the, the current editor of Rolling Stone, Mexico. And that editor gave me a job as a journalist on the magazine he, he edited back then. It was all because of Esquivel. And because of Esquivel, I also met Camilo. He used to come often to the record store. Camilo said he met him regularly. He, he went to Esquivel's home in Jutepec, Morelos. Uh, you see, south of Mexico City, going to Acapulco, one hour south, uh, you pass the Valley of Mexico, and then, then you come into a, uh, a zone uh, known as the Eternal Springtime Valley, which is Cuernavaca City. And then a suburb of Cuernavaca is Jutepec. Uh, and there's where Esquivel's family was, and uh, where, where he, when he came back to Mexico, and we, when he broke his hip, that's where he died. Well, he lived his last years. And uh, Camilo was very secretive about giving Esquivel's address. And I always ask him, like, please take me with you. Please take me. He didn't. <laughs> but in 1996, I went to London for summer. And I, I was just visiting record labels. And I met some girls that worked at Two Pure Records, the label where Stereolab was signed. Uh, and uh, this girl, Melissa Gates, she also, she also used to do documentaries for the BBC. And she told me, I'm so interested in making an audio documentary about Esquivel. I'm coming to Mexico late this fall. So she came to Mexico and I asked Camilo, Camilo, can you let me take Melissa to visit Esquivel? And yeah, Camilo gave me the address. And then it was Melissa, a friend of Melissa, a friend of mine called, uh, named Patricio and me. And we arrived to Esquivel's house, uh, a pool, bugambilias. It was beautiful. Then we entered his room. And uh, I panicked. I have to confess that it was too much for me to see this icon. Some say that in, in uh, music you, or, or artists, you, you should never meet your idols because uh, there's an image you have in your head and then there's the real image of the artist. And there was Esquivel, really old, on his pajamas, 
uh, really, really, really old. Uh, he was, it was 1996, till he lived for, say, six more years. It was so impressive, for, so astonishing for me to see him that ill, that I just left the BBC reporters in the room, and I left, and I just stayed by the poolside, waiting for the interview to be over. And when they came out, I just heard the anecdotes from them. So I didn't, I met him, I saw him, but I left the room. <laughs> Is it, was I a coward? I don't know. I, I, I'm, I don't know. I regret not meeting him. I regret being so afraid of death and illness, but I don't know. I just stayed with this mythical and fantastical image of Esquivel, always smiling, always happy. But the girl said that they were, he was flirting with, with, with them, you know, like, he had this energy. He was so vivacious. He was a gentleman, they said, but, but he, he was definitely flirt, flirting with them. So yeah, that was me meeting Esquivel. Yeah, he, sa he really did sound like a, a, a quite a colorful, quite a colorful <laughs> person in, in, a, in a lot of different ways. So I'm not surprised that the type of music that we hear came out of him from the way he's been described to me. It seems like it makes a lot of sense. I think it's funny these the, the few videos we have like that Bob Wilkins or whatever it's like so monotonous and like level headed and caught like it's almost the antithesis of of him um and just the kind of like I don't know what kind of music we play <laughs> that's like my favorite Esquivel quote <laughs> I guess he behaved like a scientist like an engineer like yeah. this was like the way gentlemen in the 20th century behaved, like really, and on, on, when you spoke on TV, you were that way. You didn't make fun of yourself. You were like technical, yeah. sharp, and delivering what you were asked for, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I could, that's probably the thing. Cameras turned on and, and being the serious artist and, and all that kind of thing. So, yes, that's a good point. <laughs> also, Everyone's not I, walking around with camera anymore, you know? There, there was like a coolness to him, right? He was smooth. He was hanging out with Frank Sinatra. You're not gonna be like the goofy guy. Yeah, yeah. In a year, you're gonna be like very well dressed, very well groomed, and just very slick. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Well, this guys, this has been really fun. Uh, I, I think it's a it's a good place to call it here. But I do know that um, Uriel, you had some goodies that you wanted to uh, to to share, right? Some playlists, is that correct? And a couple things. Do you want to talk about those things and, and drop yeah, some links? Before the, the links, can I just tell some milestones in my story that I know oh, that please. These, yes. these things I, I'll be quick. No, just, please. I already told the record store thing. Uh, back then, before the internet was popular and social networks to reach your artist, it was all about mail. So I, I wrote, I, I used to send gifts to my favorite bands. I prefer, prefer gifts and really Mexican gifts and as token of appreciation, I put those gifts in the letter, in the, in the envelope and send, the, send them over. So. I wrote to Barnum and, and I told them like how much I like Esquivel's music. And one month later, I received a letter typed in machine by Esquivel himself in a Mexican envelope, like Mexican mail post envelope, which is red, green, uh, green, white, and red. And I was amazed about receiving a letter by himself. And then there was a signed uh, picture, which is here. And, uh, <laughs> well, already the, the signature is fading, but it's him smiling and I got him on, on the back of my, my bookshelf. That's great. Yeah. And you see the frame is asymmetric. <laughs> oh yeah. It's at an angle. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it was fun. Like just, just wanted to share how was fandom be before internet and how Esquivel replied to me. So I prefer to tell that anecdote and I feel more proud about receiving the, this letter than meeting the wizard of us and going behind the curtains and seeing himself now <laughs> it's not too much <laughs> yeah, yeah. Then just uh, well i remember in 2002 when esquivel died i used to have i used to work in another radio station the rock radio station for mexico city uh, radio activo i used to have a midnight show called uh, después de todo after everything uh, it started at 11 p.m on sundays and ended at 1 a.m mondays and I invited Camilo Lara over. Uh, Esquivel died one day before, or two days, something like that. And Camilo and I played Esquivel records uh, through all those two hours. And it was very special, just, just playing his music at midnight. You know, there's a special vibe on, on radio, midnight radio shows. Uh, then another thing I want to share is just what I, sh what I said at the beginning. Like, there's this uh, sense that Arturo and I share, and also Julian, 
that there's no justice for Esquivel in Mexico. And slowly, there's something happening. You see signs like the, the orchestra, they got a great job you've been doing, like unearthing the, the party tours, the, the scripts, and, and, and moving them or offering them to the next generations. Like, they will be there uh, for everyone that is curious to reenact Esquivel's music. Then there's Arturo's film, uh, the documentaries, once and every often there comes as a person on public TV that makes a research on Esquivel and puts a, another midnight show with a, an hour on Esquivel. I saw one on Canal 11, 11 TV, which is like PBS-ish yeah. in Mexico. There's documentaries. I made a, a radio documentary in 2005 in uh, 90.9, and we won an award on the International Radio Contest in Mexico. And I will post the link here, and you will send it on the newsletter later on. Of course, it's in Spanish, but well, the music is there and music is in a universal language. Um, also, th there's this book by La Duplicadora. Perhaps there's more copies left. I strongly advise it. It's a piece of art, like a very free form. It's not quite like a biography, but there are some text parts. And the essential Esquivel is here, plus there is a poster. <laughs> Let me just quickly unfold it. There it is. Yeah. Nice. Like a solar system with Esquivel as a sun, with the <laughs> conical glasses. Speaking about glasses, uh, I just realized that I have a, an Esquivel model glasses. Maybe you can see the, <laughs> yeah. The brand, the brand is called Ben and Frank. I'll, I can post the link <laughs> later on. And yeah, it's Esquivel model glasses, lenses for the Esquivel fan. <laughs> I think I the ner I think that just topped the nerdery for the night. Yeah. I don't know if that can that nerdery can be topped. No, <laughs> except then, my shoes. Maybe I do have an Esquivel shoes, right? I, I do have yes. When I play with the big band, I do wear my Esquivel uh, wingtip shoes. Uh, there is a guy named Esquivel, rock and roll custom shoemaker in Los Angeles. Awesome shoes, very expensive shoes. I can't afford to buy them like whole, you know right off the store, but. Uh, if you like shoes, check out Esquivel. Uh, I think it's EsquivelShoes.com. So I, I sent them a note one time and told them they didn't even acknowledge. Like on Twitter, I was like, "Hey, I wear your shows when I play Esquivel." Like silence. I'm not. <laughs> I'm not an, a movie star, so uh, I didn't get any props for that. But <laughs> yeah, I just want to wrap this idea of the network that I was optimistic when I, when I was in my 20s and my 30s that I could really take Esquivel to the next level and put it in front of the society and Mexican politics would give him a place and he would be on the culture books for children, like the official one. Now, uh, Susan Wood has made a, an amazing job, but the job has still to be done. And I'm, I, I'm not going to be a pessimistic, but it's, it's really scattered. It's really sparse. Like the airports are here and there, and there's not like a nucleus happening. Maybe someone has to come into the Institute of Culture in Mexico with this obsession about Esquivel on the next presidential term. And maybe that then someone of our generation climbing to the top of one decision level uh, places, maybe there is the moment when, when this will happen. And just sharing these gifts that uh, you said, first is the documentary, the radio documentary. Uh, you see, we'll post the, the link. Then, right now, my job is at Spotify. I'm the lead editor for the Mexico team. I, we make all kind, kinds of playlists on every genre. And when Esquivel, when in 2018, January, we celebrated the centenary of his birth, we made the This is Esquivel. This is the, is the series like Best Of in Spotify. And this is Esquivel, the genius legacy of the Mexican space age sound artist. So the essential Esquivel is here. And there's also some uh, sprinkled orchestrotica tracks for us. Kronos Quartet, the Metropole Orchestra, Burbujas. So Esquivel's music is here. And if you like Exotica, we have a playlist called the Hawaiian Party for the Exotica. By the Lord. way, uh, Uriel, while you're talking, can I, pay, can I go ahead and paste those in the chat? Yeah, of okay? course. Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll pop these in the chat, but tell, tell us about those. Uh, let, me, let me share. Am I sharing my screen? No. Uh, you are. We can see your spotlighted. Oh, you're not sharing your screen, though. No, okay, not yet. So, okay. I'm sharing my screen right now, right? So, yep. hold on a second. Here's the, here's the This is Esquivel. 
Actually, I got the pictures from Erwin Chusit, the author behind the, the Barnum compilation in 94. It was really hard to get some official authorized pictures. RCA in Mexico didn't have any, and that tells you a lot about how Mexican institutions and companies care about his legacy. So I got it from Irwin. Then there's the Hawaiian party for, you know, exotica in every level from Arthur Lehman and then and Martin Denny to the, to the ultra lounge compilations from Emmy music back, back in the nineties, everything is here. And I also made this other playlist called golden instrumentals, which is for mu music lovers. Santo and Johnny Farina, Walter Wanderley, a little bit of Bosa Nova, Henry Mancini, Francis Lay. I know you love this. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, finally, uh, you see when uh, I'll stop screen sharing now. Okay, so I used to host and produce a, a radio show for Red Bull called Pan America with, with the Latin alternative music from all Latin America, of course. And when Juan Gabriel, a great uh, a musician from Mexico, died in 2016, I asked the graphic designer Oscar Reyes to make an icon of Juan Gabriel as if, if he would be like a patron saint thing. Can you see the picture? Yeah, yeah. So this is Juan Gabriel as a patron saint, and he's got like a mariachi hat. <laughs> I, I've got it like framed in gold. And awesome. when the centenary of festival happened, um, let me share my screen again. Here we are. I asked Oscar Reyes from Todo Bien Studio to make something similar about Esquivel. So here it is. And this is available as a WeTransfer link for you to download and print. This is on high resolution, so you can make a poster out of this or like a little stamp that you can carry in your wallet and he will bring you luck and protection and good vibes <laughs> and <laughs> you know all things as to go so the link will be also shared by brian and hope you like this token yep i think i popped that in there already the we transfer so thank thank you for for sharing that it's great now I and don't... again i i will pop I, I i know we'll all lose the zoom chat when we hang up the the uh, call tonight but i will i will send these out to the list so if you're on uh, Facebook and you're not on the mailing list, just head over to orchestratica.com or remotelymusic.com and you can hop on our list and uh, that I'll get I'll get these links out so you guys have them and you can check all this stuff out. So cool. Anything else you guys would like to add, uh, Arturo Uriel? I, I, don't, I don't know how to stop sharing. <laughs> the button doesn't. Oh, I, I think I can. Put I in can. some of the central controls. <laughs> uh, let's see here. Uh... There should be a little red uh, uh, button somewhere, but I think I can find it. Stop sharing. Ah, there we go. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Cool. Um, if there's no other questions, uh, I, I, I think we'll, we'll wrap it up here. Uh, just some closing thoughts. Thank you again. Muchas gracias to, to Arturo and, and Uriel for coming on the show and, and also for all of you for contributing uh, your thoughts here tonight. It's, it's always fun to, to be able to meet fans and, and to talk about uh, the art and the music and, and, and this stuff, given everything that's that's going on in the world right now. It's, it's nice to get lost in, in something positive like this. So, so thank you so much uh, for coming on the show. Um, we will be back, uh, I believe July 17th is the next Remotely Music series. Uh, the topic is TBD. So if you're on the mailing list, uh, you'll definitely uh, get information about that when it comes out. And again, I will send all this stuff out. Um, I'll just drop uh, social media links in really quickly uh, for Uriel and for Arturo. If you guys want to follow him, them on uh, Instagram and or Twitter, uh, they're there. And I think uh, we'll just leave it at that. So thank you again, everybody, and uh, have a great night. And we will see you guys soon. Okay. Bye. Take care, thank everybody. You. Buenas noches. Yep. Buenas noches.